All right, let's look at Revelation 17. This is really interesting right here, Revelation 17. So what we believe about the ten kings and kingdoms, in my last Bible study that you watched, which I recommend to watch, the seven-headed dragon and the ten-horned antichrist. If you watch that one, I mentioned to you about the ten horns. And the ten horns are actually ten kings in the Bible. There's no doubt about that. And these ten kings, how we identified them, I gave you the list of all these kings and kingdoms. But here's something important to understand, okay? If you look at Revelation 17, look at verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten what? Kings. But look at this. This is not talking about, when it talks about these ten kings, it says, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Huh. Wait a minute right here. These are kings that didn't have a king and kingdom yet. So, Pastor, wouldn't this kind of contradict with your previous video teaching when you listed out these ten kings and kingdoms? Here's the answer to this. This is why this is very interesting. These ten king and kingdoms turned into something else, you got to realize, in the future. In the future, these ten king and kingdoms transform into something else. And that is the Roman Empire, the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Empire. That's what these things turned into. You might say, Pastor, how do you know that it's the Roman Catholic Empire, these ten kings? The reason why is because, look at the verse right here, what the Bible says. In verse 2, uh, verse 3, excuse me, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven head and ten horns. So this woman who rides this beast, what is she called? Look at verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, what? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So notice that this ten-horned beast is connected. It's connected with the woman who rode the beast. And that is the Roman Catholic Church. It says Babylon, right? But this Babylon, that's why I keep stressing that you have to make Babylon Roman Catholic Church. Because it's going to show you something connected to Roman. There's no doubt about it. Anyways, taking to that to account, I'm not going to go through all the points proving it, okay? So let's just take this to account. The woman who rode the beast is called Babylon, and that's the Roman Catholic Church. There's no doubt about that. Now, look at Daniel 7. Go to Daniel 7. Keep your hand at Revelation 17. But go to Daniel chapter 7. And then, when you have Daniel 7, go to Daniel 2. Go to Daniel 2. Go to Daniel 7 and Daniel 2. Now, this is really important to understand why it has to be Roman Catholic. There's no doubt, whether you like it or not, Rome is connected. Rome has to be connected to this. Now remember, it's a, it's a ten-horned beast. Yes? Yes. It's a ten-horned beast. There is no doubt about that. It's a ten-horned beast. I'm repeating this over and over because I need to show you something important here. But let's go one by one. Let's start with Daniel chapter 2. And then you're going to notice at verse 38, verse 38, And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and fowls of the heaven hath he given into thy hand, and hath made thee, that's Nebuchadnezzar Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar Babylon, made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So the gold is Babylon. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Okay, in history, what was a kingdom that happened after Nebuchadnezzar Babylon. That's Persia, right? So here we go, Persia. Uh, and another third kingdom of brass. Okay, what was after Persia when you study history? That's Greece, right? Okay, Greece. 
And if you think about history, what was after Greece? Rome, right? Okay, let's keep reading. And another third kingdom of brass, that's Greece, which shall bear rule over all the earth. That makes a lot of sense because Alexander the Great was going conquering throughout all the world. Now the next kingdom, Rome, right? And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as what? Iron. So that's important. So iron has to be Rome. Keep that in mind. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Okay, remember that. Since this fourth kingdom is iron, it has to break and bruise. Now, look at this one. This is really interesting. Look at the next kingdom. Here's the Antichrist kingdom. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. Okay, look at this. This next kingdom, this fifth kingdom, that comes out, it carries what? It's mixed with iron. Why? It's carrying the strength of the iron. Iron has to be connected with this fifth kingdom. And notice that the kingdom is divided among these toes. How many toes? Ten. That's why what? In Revelation 17, these kings divide the kingdom. Ten kings. See that? So these ten kings is definitely referring to this fifth kingdom with ten toes because they divide the kingdom from each other. But these ten toes, these ten kings, have to carry what? The power of iron. Iron is what? Rome. That's why these ten kingdoms is what? Roman Catholic Empire. These ten kings is Roman Catholic Empire. See that? Why? Because this fourth kingdom, Rome, is gone. But didn't Rome continue through what? It switched to a mystery form, a spiritual form, Roman Catholic. But that's why this is called what? Mystery Babylon. It's a mystery spiritual form. It's not a public, outward, secular form. It fell. It switched into a mystery, spiritual, religious form. See how certain words in the Bible, every word in the Bible is perfect, and it's there to fit and show you something important. That book, don't mess with the book, but look at Daniel 7. This is even more convincing. Daniel 7. After this I saw in the night visions, uh, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had what? Great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. That wording about iron stamping and breaking in pieces matched with Daniel 2 about the iron breaking and bruising, right? But look at this. This is what? This is the ten-horned beast, the ten kings. Keep reading. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had what? Ten horns. But not only that, out of these ten horns comes out the Antichrist. Look at verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom, were, uh, whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. There's the Antichrist. Right there. How we know that this little horn is the Antichrist is because you just read verse 19, and then you read verse 20 of chapter 7, and then you read verse 24, and then you read verse 25. Then you read verse 26 and 27. See, there's no doubt. This whole context is Antichrist with his ten kings and kingdom. That's all in the context right there, if you read that whole verse. So look at that. The Bible shows you then in the future, see, originally these ten kings, what happened? It transformed into the Roman Catholic Empire in the future when the Antichrist sets up his kings and kingdoms. So that's what happened. All these different nations and countries turn into that. 
And then once it turns into this Roman Catholic Empire, the Antichrist, when he comes over, he's going to take over the world, and he's going to start his Roman Catholic Empire. And through this Roman Catholic Empire, then he starts to divide out the ten kings after that. But they're all connected to Roman Catholic Empire. Because look at this. If you don't believe me, look at Revelation 17, verse 16. Revelation 17, verse 16. There is no doubt these ten kings are connected from the Roman Catholic Empire. They come from the Roman Catholic Empire. Why? Because they have to betray her so that they can grow more in power. Boom. Look at verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Look at that. Why do these ten kings turn against Babylon, Rome? Why would they do that? See that? They came from her. There's no doubt. There's a connection with these ten kings. And it makes sense why they would turn against her. They would turn against her so that they can advance their own empires. That's a historical fact and a common sense fact that when these kings grow more in power, what do you study throughout history? They want to advance more in power. There's always betrayals, assassination attempts, etc. and etc. Now it makes perfect sense. So now you got the Roman Catholic Empire, these ten kings. But then they branch off from this Roman Catholic Empire into ten federated kingdoms throughout the world. Now what are those ten federated kingdoms throughout the world? There are going to be ten continents. There's going to be ten continents. We got seven, but the Antichrist is going to break it apart where it's going to be ten different federations, ten different continents. The possible rulers, there are three possibilities. One, it could refer to uh, literal, it can refer to literal fallen angels ruling over those t as ten kings. The second thing, which is possible, it could refer to the Illuminati bloodlines, actually. If you study elites, there are a bunch of families. There are 13 main families, it is said. There are 13 main families who control all the world, so to speak. You have the Astor family, the Bundy family, the Collins family, the DuPont family, the Freeman family, the Kennedy family, that's six, the Lee family, seven, the Anasis family, the Rockefeller, the Rothschilds, and then you got the Russell, the Van Dune, and I think I forgot to write down 13 right here, so whoever the 13th one is. But there are 12 or 13 bloodlines in the Illuminati, they say. But the Bible says there's 10. So you're going to probably have to knock out three somehow. But if you knock out these three, you're going to notice right here that it could be these 10 Illuminati elites. But you can't say they're normal humans, though. You have to say, you have to say they're reptilian. Why? Because look at Daniel 2. Look at Daniel 2. Who are these ten kings? That's why fallen angels make sense. See that? That's why it has to be demoniacs as one possibility. If you want to go to the second possibility of Illuminati bloodlines, then you have to argue them as being connected to demoniac. The reason why is this. Look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength. Now look at this. The strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with clay. Okay, so this is iron mixing with clay. Who is this iron part and the clay part in verse 42 now? And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so what is this referring to, this mingling of iron and clay? So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, what's the meaning for that, Pastor? Iron mixed with clay. We saw how iron was connected with Rome, there's no doubt about that, and ten kings. We see that. Iron is connected with ten kings and with Rome. But look at this. It's more specific about this iron. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, whoever they are, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Remember, iron mixed with clay, 
they mix with men. Boom, seed of men. That's humans. So whoever they are, they're not humans then. They have to be something outside, other beings. And when you and when's the only time in the Bible you see other beings mingling with humans? Genesis 6. Sons of God coming with the daughters of men. Not only that, Luke 17 warns you that in the tribulation it will be like the days of Genesis 6 of Noah. That mingling and marriage. So you're going to have to argue then that these, uh, that's why there are conspiracy videos online that argue that these Illuminati bloodlines, these families, that they have to be reptilians. But me, I can't go that far because the reason why is I'm giving you two possibilities. I don't know which one's which. One could be fallen angels themselves or two, it could be the Illuminati bloodline, but you have to say they're reptilian. So if these people, so I can't go that far for a fact as a 100% certainty. I'm responsible for being objective and empirical and 100% truth to you. So I'm going to do it that way. So if these people are humans, then they're, they can't qualify then. Or it could go with possibility three, all right? Possibility three. Possibility three, these people are just normal people, these Illuminati bloodline, but they can be so much filled with demon possession, they can transform into a demoniac form. What? Really, Pastor? Look at John 6. Look at John 6. That is possible. Look at John 6. Because let me ask you a question, okay? Isn't God going to transform our bodies into his body? Do you think the devil will have a problem to transform such human bodies into like his body? Your daddy, the devil. And isn't it interesting, Jesus says, ye are of your father, the devil, and that ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. See, Satan, he can do that. Look at uh, John chapter 6, and we'll look at verse 70, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you, one of the twelve disciples, is, present tense, a what? Devil. Whoa. Whoa. Ain't that something right there? Judas Iscariot is, present tense, a devil. It's not, he wasn't just demon possessed. This was something even more beyond that, where he's a devil. So you see right here, you can, so it could refer to the Illuminati bloodlines then, if they're normal humans. But then if, if, I can't say for a fact, if those are the people that become the ten kings, then Satan, what he's going to have to do is take those people, and somehow they make a covenant and an oath, which, you know, they already did, He's going to have to make them a physical covenant oath with them where he makes them likened to his image and transforms them into demoniacs. But then what? Power play struggle. Power play struggle because they're not content to become from the Roman Catholic Empire. They betray it, burn her with fire so that they can grow more in their own power. In this tribulation, I'm going to tell you one thing. This is going to be wild concerning elites and power plays. It's going to be extremely wild. You got the Antichrist running, and then you got the Antichrist running as the Pope, mixture of black and white Pope powers. You got the Roman Catholic Empire running through its ten federated kingdoms, which whoever these ten federated kingdoms are, possibly Illuminati bloodlines or fallen angels. Uh, there is more to it than meets the eye about this power play. And then I mentioned in my other videos a lot of different nations in power plays, right? United States of America, you also have the rogue nations that the Antichrist has to verse against, which I argued is referring to uh, Russian or communist related countries and Muslim nations that the Antichrist has to verse. There is a lot of interesting power play as we hit the tribulation. And that's why you can see everything connecting the dots in the tribulation. Israel undoubtedly is a key player in the tribulation. The Antichrist has to take Israel. Why? Because the Antichrist is going to be a Jew. And Jerusalem will be his headquarters. Because that's where God's going to land and set up his quarter, headquarters. Understand that you have to, that's why it's so important to argue Catholic Church as Babylon, Roman, 
uh, Roman power is connected to Babylon. It's all connected to Antichrist, these chapters, and especially, you got to understand, even powerful elites and Illuminati. The reason why is this, is that I gave another different video. It's a very long video. It's titled, uh, I forgot, but basically it's titled uh, Top Elites, Top Elites and Blood Oaths. Top Elites and Blood Oaths. And then if you look at that one, I give all these documentations that the Roman Catholic Church is the main power play, the best candidate as the head top elite. And all these other families that are mentioned in the Illuminati bloodlines, they're subservient. For example, so we see right here that the Illuminati, for example, when it was started, it was started by Adam Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt. But Adam Weishaupt, you got to understand, it's a historical fact. He was personally trained by a Jesuit. He was personally trained by a Jesuit. Here's another thing. Rothschild, he's the one responsible for funding the Illuminati, right? That's why Rothschild is undoubtedly, even all conspiracy, nearly all conspiracy theorists would agree, Rothschild is one of the top ladder, or if not the top ladder in the elites. But Rothschild, you got to understand, it was the superior Jesuit general that found Rothschild and got him and Weishaupt together. Not only that, Rothschild, when he was funding the Illuminati, you gotta understand this, when he was funding that Illuminati, the Jesuits were the one that organized everything. They got it all set up, and you gotta realize this, you know what Rothschild is currently called his name? Guardian of the Treasury of the Vatican. So I don't know if I said that word exactly correct, but that's what he's called. Why? He's responsible for the treasury and the wealth for the Vatican. Their guardian. See that? There's no doubt. Rome is connected with top elites. Not only that, there are documentations. For one example, Alberto Rivera, who was a former Jesuit priest. Former Jesuit. And he did undercover stuff, too undercover stuff, conspiracy stuff, that attacked Christians. When he kissed the ring on one of his superiors, it was a Masonic symbol. And you gotta realize this, Freemasons and Jesuits, they can be more intertwined than you think. The Illuminati, we all know this, when the Illuminati was disbanded, so to speak, in the early days of America, where did they flee to? The, free, the lodges, right? The Masonic lodges. They all fled to there. That's why a lot of Freemasonry is connected to the Illuminati. But here's another interesting thing. The Masonic Oath, you know who it was written by? A Jesuit. It was written by a Jesuit. The Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. And that is the Masonic Oath, Scottish Rite Freemasonry, where Albert Pike, who was the head of it, actually said Lucifer is the god of Masonry. But that's why the Jesuit oath and Masonic oath, why do they both have blood oaths then? Unless there's a connection. Isn't that interesting? Another thing is this, is that you know when the Illuminati was founded? When Adam Weishaupt officially founded the Illuminati with Rothschild funding it? It was at a Jesuit university. Of course. There's no doubt. See, you have to connect Rome to this. It ignores all the facts of history especially conspiracy stuff, that the Jesuits and Rome, they have a big power play going on right here. Big power play going on right here. So there is no doubt Roman Catholic Empire is connected to top elites right here. They're connect. That's why when people argue about certain Masons or Catholic or Jews, which are connected with Rothschild as being the top, you got to realize this. The Jesuits were the ones who... That's why it's so perfect that the Roman Catholic Empire is one that gives birth to these kings. You see that? So it, this is how it works. The Roman Catholic Empire, if you picture it like the octopus, it's the head. It's the head. But out of this head comes out many tentacles where they fight and resist each other. That's why if you look at all these elites, you see contradictions as well. These people having power play struggles, fighting against each other, turning against each other. And that's why conspiracy theories can be such a maze that you don't know who's really in charge or what's going on or it, which one's which. But the easy answer is, don't get into specifics because you'll blow your brains out. 
What's safe to say and what's an undoubtable fact is that Jesuits have always been on top. They are always involved. And from this, it gave birth to all these different factions, power plays, Rothschilds, Rockefellers, other Illuminati bloodlines, Freemasons, and then uh, Jews, etc. It gave birth to all this kind of stuff. The Round Table, CFR, etc. By the way, two national uh, two intelligence a agencies CIA and FBI do you know what the FBI J Edgar Hoover right J Edgar Hoover is the founder Mason Mason CIA William Donovan Catholic Knights of Malta wow. there's a lot of connections a lot of strange weird connections so there's no doubt you have to argue this but that's why it makes sense. Doesn't it make sense that these ten kings will betray the Roman Catholic Empire at the end times? Their mama. No wonder it's called mother of harlots and abominations. Mother. Mother. No wonder it's the mother. Why? It's the mother that gave birth to all these things. See, scripture was scripture and makes all these conspiracy facts and historical facts come even more into light. You've got to be convinced Babylon is Rome then. And I didn't even give an apologetic defensive manner proving it. I just gave all these interesting things that really show it.